Amen. It is from the struggles that we grow. Maybe the bad things in life happen for a reason. Can you imagine being 17 years old and being able to say that? You watched your mom beat on a pole, only to pass away a few months later, living in poverty, and then somehow God reaches down and grabs a hold of your life and he ends up in this mission and his life is changed forever. You know, trials and tribulations and difficulties can send us one or two directions. They can send us into God's arms or they can send us away from God's arms. And a lot of times it depends on how we react and what we do and where our faith is and our view of who God is. And this is really true. We're going to spend the next couple of weeks, seven weeks, looking at the couple of books in the New Testament written by a guy named Paul. And Paul was one of the early founders and fathers of Christianity. He wasn't the original 12 disciples, but he was pretty close to it, and knew most of them, hung out with most of them. But Paul actually was Saul, who was the Pharisee that when the church first was born, went out and started persecuting the church and dragging these new Christians, this Jewish sect, bringing them out in the streets. And literally, when one of the original disciples was stoned to death, Stephen, Saul at that point, or who we call Paul, was there overseeing the whole thing. But then he encounters Jesus on the road to Damascus. You can read about it in the book of Acts if you want. And has this transformation, but it's not an easy transformation. Because he goes from being this Jewish religious leader, this, the, 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 the point person for trying to snuff out this faith, to the person who takes this faith because he has this encounter with Jesus Christ. And he's the one that primarily takes the message and the gospel of Jesus Christ all around the Roman Empire to cities like Corinth and Philippi and Colossus and Ephesus, which we're going to see in the next couple of weeks. And because he does that, you can imagine his life isn't easy. Most speculate he probably lost his family. He was probably disowned by his family. If he had children, they would have never spoken to him again. And then there's just the struggles from day to day of dealing with churches and people that have all kinds of sexual immorality messed up and Judaizers, Jewish Christians that were trying to reinvent Christianity and oppose all kinds of rules and laws of the Old Testament. And it was like a pastor's nightmare. And he was doing this from all over the place with no internet, no cell phones, no phones, just writing letters. And those are the letters, some of them, that we have today in the New Testament that we're going to look at over the next couple of weeks. Now, when he writes Philippians and Colossians, which are the two books we're going to look at in the next two months, Paul is in prison. Now, he's in prison for his faith, specifically because the Jewish people have targeted him because he's the leader who's leading this movement and because he used to be Jewish and because whenever he came into a town, he would first go to the Jewish people and tell them the good news about Jesus. And some would come to faith and some wouldn't. And then those that wouldn't would cause all kinds of trouble. So much so that Paul eventually ends up on a journey from Jerusalem to Rome where he's in chains to stand for his faith. And while he's in chains, while he's under house arrest, he writes these letters to encourage the church and to admonish the church and to give them some doctrine about how you're supposed to live and what God expects from us as Christians and believers. And the book of Philippians is a great book because you'll see the word joy, 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 joy keep coming up over and over again. And you've got to ask yourself, why is Paul so joyful? Because he's in chains, he's in prison, he's in house arrest, waiting trial, which ultimately most scholars believe led to his death. And so we're going to spend the next couple of weeks just piling through these books and looking for the principles and the lessons that just kept Paul going. Because for many of us, we face struggles and trials and tribulations of all kinds and sorts every single day. Now, most of us at this point in history aren't going to end up in prison for our faith. But we have families, we have workplaces, we have stress, we have economies, we have all kinds of stuff that changes and fluid in our society. And so sometimes... Life is difficult. Sometimes life sends us trials and tribulations and struggles, maybe not as extreme as we saw this morning, or maybe some of you have come out of some of those extreme situations. And the question is, what do we do? How do we handle those situations? What do we look for? Where do we find that joy 
that we see in Paul. So if you'd like to follow along, we're going to read the first chapter of Philippians this morning. I'm reading from the NIV. It'll be on the screen, or you can open up your Bibles. In Philippians chapter 1, verses 1 and following, this is what it reads. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. Timothy was Paul's protege. To all God's holy people in Jesus Christ at Philippi, together with the overseers and deacons, grace and peace to you from our God, our Father, and our Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God every time I remember you. In all my prayers for all of you, I always pray, here's the word, with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the very first day until now. An amazing piece of scripture. If you want to memorize a good memory verse, this is it. Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Jesus Christ. What an amazing promise. Verse 7, it is right for me to feel this way about you since I have you in my heart and whether I am in chains or defending or confirming the gospel, that's the context of what he's writing, God can testify how I long for all of you with the affection of Jesus Christ. What a great pastor. And this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth and insight so that you may be able to discern What is best may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and the praise of God. Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has happened to me actually served to advance the gospel. As a result, it has become clear throughout the whole palace guard and to everyone else that I am in chains for Christ. And because of my chains, most of the brothers and sisters have become confident in the Lord and dare all the more to proclaim the gospel without fear. You see, the Jewish leaders and the religious leaders and the Romans, they were putting Paul in prison and putting him on trial because they wanted to get rid of this new Christian faith. They wanted to squash it out. What Paul's saying, hey, it's actually doing the opposite. It's making the church grow. Do you know that the last 80 years for Christianity has actually been the worst time in history for Christianity? You know why in the Western world? Because we haven't had persecution. The church has failed miserably for the last 80 years in a lot of contexts because we just don't have the persecution and trials and tribulations that the early church had. It's a struggle. It's the the double-edged sword of affluence and blessing in life. where We're doing really well, and we're doing so great that sometimes we just go, well, I don't need God. But in Paul's context, he's in prison, he's in chains, they're trying to kill this Christian movement, and it's actually doing the opposite. Verse 15, it is true that some preach Christ out of envy and rivalry, but others out of goodwill. Well, that's a little odd. The later do so out of love, knowing that I am put here for the defense of the gospel. The former preach Christ out of selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing they can stir up trouble for me while I am in chains. If you read through some of the other letters, First and Corinthians and some of the others, there's a lot of people causing trouble for Paul. They were people that came to faith, they became Christians, but then they were strong leaders and they were starting to say, hey, Paul isn't their supreme gospel leader. And they were just causing all kinds of grief, trying to teach different doctrine, trying to teach these churches different things about Jesus Christ. And it was just pulling many people away from Christ. And some were pulling away from Christ and some were leading people to Christ, but for the wrong reasons and for the wrong motives. And Paul says here, hey, they're trying to take advantage of me. They're trying to undermine, undercut what I've taught and what I've done, which could get us really upset and could get him really offended, but he doesn't do that. Verse 18, but what does it matter? The important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached, and because of this, I rejoice. There's these super apostles, if you read in Corinthians, that that were trying to knock down Paul, and he says, I don't care. It's as long as Jesus Christ is preached, as long as the gospel is preached, I don't care who does it, and I don't even really care about their motives, whether they're selfish or not. Pastors are just human beings like everybody else. We've seen in the last couple of weeks, a, a couple of them fall and make front headlines on the newspapers and Yahoo because they've had different failings. They're just people like you, me, no different than you. So Paul doesn't care how or why. He just cares that the gospel is preached. And listen to this. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice for I know that through your prayers and God's provision of the Spirit of Jesus Christ, what has happened to me will turn out for my deliverance. 
I, am e I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body, whether life or by death. And that's not just words that are being written. Paul ultimately would face death for his faith. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am to go on living in this body, this will mean fruitful labor for me, yet what shall I choose? I do not know. I am torn between the two. I desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is better by far, but it is more necessary for you that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you for your progress and with a joy and faith so that through my being with you again, your boasting in Jesus Christ will abound on account of me. Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you in my absence, I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as for one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that, and that by God. For it has been granted to you on behalf of Jesus Christ not only to believe in him, but also to suffer in him since you are going through the same struggle you saw I had and now hear that I still have. These churches, just like Paul, were also struggling. Many of them were also being persecuted for their faith and for their beliefs. Many of them were being thrown out of their social circles and their networks and their economic stability and losing jobs because of their faith. Some of them were being thrown out of the synagogue if they were Jewish and losing their status. Some of them were being hunted down. This was a difficult time for the church, but at the same point, an exciting time for the church because it was growing. And Paul is filled with joy for this church and writes this letter to encourage them. And here's just a couple of thoughts about when we think about trials, when we think about the struggles in life, what should we do? How do we focus? How do we be like Paul in this first chapter? No matter what comes our way. And here's a couple of principles that I see that jump out of the page for me through Paul. The first one, is that he thinks of others. You know, if you were in prison, if you were in chains, the temptation would be, my temptation would be just to, oh, poor me. You know, this is so unfair. This is not right. You know, I haven't done anything wrong. This really isn't a big deal. Like, why is this happening to me? You ever find yourself in that situation where you're going through something difficult in life and you start questioning why this is happening to you? And when you look around you, it's like, everybody else is happy. Everybody else is okay. Everybody else is prospering. But I'm the one that's struggling financially. I'm the one where my family isn't where I want them to be. I'm the one that has these struggles. I'm the one that has these health issues. Why does nobody else have these problems? How come it's just me? And it's easy in our struggles and our trials to isolate ourselves, to play what we call the victim. And the problem is, is when we play the victim is we isolate ourselves and that's exactly what the enemy wants. Because when you're isolated from community, when you're isolated from your church and your family and your people groups that love Jesus Christ, it only gets worse. You feel more sorry for yourself because, oh, these people don't even love me anymore. Those people don't want to have anything to do with me anymore. And we start to play this me versus them game. And Paul could have very easily done that. He had Timothy, but what about all these other leaders? What about all these other churches? Why weren't they standing up for me? Why weren't they doing something? Why am I here? He could have very easily focused on himself, but he thinks of other people. In verse 3, he's happy. I thank God every time I remember you and all my prayers, I pray for you. Because of your partnership, being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion. He's focusing and thinking about other people. You know, when you're going through a difficult time in life, resist the urge to isolate yourself and try and think of other people. And, and that you can do what Paul does. You can pray for other people. You can actually get involved in other people's lives. You can give to other people time, energy, resources, whatever it is. Paul couldn't go anywhere. He was in chains. But he writes a letter to encourage the church. We can do the same thing. You see, when we begin to think of others and we move beyond ourselves and our situation and our circumstance and how we feel, it's amazing how it changes our attitude and our heart and how God can use that powerfully. 
When we're connected with each other, we thrive. In his book, Being, Mo uh, Being Mortal, medical doctor Atu Gwanda, I hope I pronounced that name right, describes the story of Bill Thomas, a man who in the 1990s started working at the medical as the medical director of Chase Memorial Nursing Home in New Berlin, New York. He was only 31 with no or little experience in elder care. With his newcomer's eyes, Bill was shocked by the three plagues of nursing home existence, boredom, loneliness, and helplessness. His plan was simple. Start bringing in gardens, children, and pets into the nursing home. Lots of pets. Here's a snippet of the conversation that ensued after the nursing home director and his staff agreed to let Thomas bring in more plants into the home. So you got permission to get the plants. How about a dog, Thomas asked. There were the safety code issues, but maybe so, the director said, we, we could let a dog in. It's against the code, they repeated. Well, let's try two dogs. Well, but that's even more against the code, they repeated. Well, let's just put it down on paper, Thomas said. And against, it's against the code, they said. Well, we'll put it down on paper. Dr. Bill, not seeing much enthusiasm in his response, but thought he was in a role, said, well, how about cats? <laughs> you want dogs and cats, they asked. They reluctantly agreed. Perfect, said Bill, beaming, and we need more of a sound of life in this place. You know what would be best? The sounds of birds singing. Let's put down 100. 100 birds in this place, they exclaimed. This is a true story, by the way. You must be out of your mind. Have you ever lived in a house that has two dogs and four cats and 100 birds? Yes. <laughs> Maybe this is why I identify with this. When my wife and I got married, um, we started w with an a, a, a umbrella cockatoo, then we had a couple lovebirds, and then we had some cockatiels, and then we had some African... When we moved in our last house into it that I built, we had a hundred birds from cockatiels and lovebirds all the way up to the big, uh, big macaws. So we've, we, I can identify with this, but not in a nursing home. And we had a dog outside and a cat. No, Bill said, smiling, but wouldn't it be worth trying? <laughs> oh, really? Eventually, Dr. Bill wore them down, and they ordered the birds. The hundred parakeets all arrived the same day, but the bird cages hadn't come yet. <laughs> so the delivery man released the birds into the nursing home's beauty salon. The results were extraordinary. Listen to this. A number of prescriptions halved with a particular reduction in the use of psychotic drugs, and mortality fell by 15%. This was a starting point for a larger program named Eden Alternative. Why was the Eden Alternative so successful? Gawande concludes that we need loyalty, a dedication to a cause beyond ourselves. It doesn't matter what this cause is, or even if it's small, like looking after a small pet or a bird, or large. What matters is, is that such a cause provides meaning to one's life. We all need loyalty, and elder peop elderly people need it even more. People also need a sense of belonging. We have an innate desire to be part of something larger than ourselves. When we are connected to life and to each other, we thrive. When we are disconnected, we die. What an amazing story. A bit extreme. But amazing, and, and it shows us the value of connectedness and purpose. When, when, when the book 40 Days of Purpose was written, if you've never read the book, order it online and just read it. And it sold millions and millions of copies by Rick Warren. Why? There's a copy in the library if you want to grab it. Why did this book sell millions of copies? Because people are looking for connectedness. They're looking for purpose in life. And this is what the gospel gives us when we go through trials and tribulations and we think of other people, it connects us to them. In Romans chapter 12, verse 3, for by the grace written by Paul, given to me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. Think of others. When Jesus gave us the greatest commandment, in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37, we all know it. Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. And the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. This is the value of community and thinking of other people. Even when everything against us screams, don't think about anybody else. Play the victim. It's all about you. You're so bad. It's just such a difficult situation and everything is horrible. And it very well may be. But when we begin to think of other people like Paul, we begin to dig ourselves out of that hole. Think of others. Secondly, keep a kingdom focus. 
I love this whole dialogue back and forth in verses 12 and following where Paul, he didn't even have to put this in. For some odd reason he didn't. I think it's because this, he was trying to show us that, you know what, we need to think about the greater picture. Because Paul really was was facing this struggle where there were these other leaders that were trying to do things and say things and change the Christian doctrine and change the gospel and change the things that Paul had taught them and take leadership out of his hands. It was, it was pretty rough. And it would be very easy, again, not to think about other people, to play the victim, but he keeps a broader picture. And he says, it's not about me. I don't care how the gospel's preached just as long as it's preached. Just as long as the good news gets out there. It doesn't matter what happens. It doesn't even matter their motives. As long as the gospels preach, God will be God and he'll look after it. And it's his Holy Spirit that moves in people's hearts and lives to transform them. Not Paul, not me, not you. But it's difficult sometimes to keep that kingdom focus. Because it's easy just to focus in on our situation and our circumstance. And Paul could have very well done that, but he didn't. He keeps his mind focused on the kingdom and the end goal that people need to come to faith, that people need the same joy, the same hope, the same purpose that Paul has found. In the light of eternity, that's all that matters. He wrestles with, should I die? Should I stay? Should I go? Because for him, it was very real. And he, his conclusion is, I'm going to stay. I'm going to fight this fight and I'm going to be here as long as I can. Even though I'd rather be with Jesus Christ, I'm going to go here as long as I can in chains, whatever God brings me, whatever trials and tribulations. Why? Not so that life could be good. Not so that you could enjoy the grandchildren. Not so, you know, fill in the blank. No, the reason why is so that the gospel will get preached. I mean, that's incredible. The tenacity, the dedication the priorities in his life that he saw the world in light of eternity. That it wasn't just about him, even though he was one of the greatest church fathers we've ever had. Phil Cook and Jonathan Black shared in their recent book um, that the author and speaker Francis Chan has best described eternity like this. He did this in a sermon illustration once. He took a rope. And he took the rope and he started at this end and he walked out the door <laughs> and went out of the street and just kind of threw it and just kind of left it there. And then came back in and he took a little marker and all he did was mark a little dot on that rope. And he said the rope of eternity goes that way forever and the rope for eternity goes that way forever. And that little black dot is just our time. And it helps just to put a little bit perspective in about what our lives are like and what they're supposed to be like. This time is short. And to live can be a struggle. It can be difficult. And to die is gain, but we live to lead others and to point others to Jesus Christ. Think of others. Keep a kingdom focus. And lastly, he says and tells them, stand firm in your faith. Don't give up. It's so easy to give up, isn't it? (laughs) When things aren't going the way that we want, when we're having a bad day or we haven't slept for nights or we don't have the money in the bank that we want or we're wrestling with our health issues or our families are doing things that we don't agree with or they're walking away from God or whatever the situation is, it's really easy just to give up and wave the white flag. Yeah, can't be bothered anymore. And Paul says, don't. Stand firm in your faith. Don't give up. Don't let the world, don't let the trials and the the tribulations steal your joy, steal your relationship with Jesus Christ, steal the light that God has given you to be to this world that needs it so desperately. And as we open up our cell phones, as we open up the newspapers, as we open up the magazines, as we listen to the radios, Facebook, wherever it is, our world desperately needs the light of Jesus Christ again. Desperately. And they're looking for people that have this uncanny ability and passion like Paul that are willing to think of others, that are willing to put this kingdom focus and to see the end in mind and to stand firm for their faith no matter what people throw at us. You see, if we can live that way, if we can be that type of people, then God will use our lives and our situations, good or bad, 
for his kingdom, for his glory. The questions for us this week as we go from this place to this is, first of all, are you thinking of others? No matter what your situation or circumstance is, even more so when you find yourself in difficult times, are you willing, are you able, will you make a commitment to think of others? Pray for them. Write them a note. Give them a phone call. Share your faith with them. Whatever it is that God is stirring in your heart, are you willing to think of others even when everything in your life is falling apart? Are you living for the moment? Or are you living for eternity? Where's your focus? Is it on earthly gains or is it eternally gains? And lastly, are you thriving in your struggles, in your persecution, in your difficulties, in your trials, in your tribulations? Stand firm in your faith. Rely on God's Holy Spirit to carry you through and he will just as he did with Paul. And he will give you that joy that only comes in that relationship with Jesus Christ no matter what happens in the world around us. Let's pray. Father, we are so grateful and so thankful that you have given us your spirit, your Holy Spirit to live and dwell inside of us when we enter into that relationship with you. We thank you that no matter what trials and tribulations come our way in this world, that you have given us the ability to stand firm, to love you and to love others because you first loved us. This morning, if you're going through difficulties or struggles or trials and you're listening online and you're just resting with your faith, I encourage you to start thinking of other people. Start praying for other people. Start giving whatever that looks like. Follow Paul's example and just see what happens. See what God does with your life. See what God does with those letters, those prayers, those calls, those resources. You know, are you living for the moment or eternity? It's a tough question. We're investing our time and our energy and our money. It shows really quick what we're doing with our life. Father, may we be a people that are willing to stand firm in the face of any adversity, just as Paul. For this we pray in your name, Jesus. Amen.